Hey, everybody, Moto America fans and anybody else out there who might have stumbled upon this podcast. This is Off Track with Carruthers and Vice. It's uh, Moto America's weekly uh, podcast. And uh, I'm joined, as always, today by Sean Vice, who happens to be in Colorado. I'm in the great state of California, although some people probably won't agree with that. But uh, Sean, how are, how's it going over there today? I'm doing well, but you know, <laughs> I'm not in Colorado. <laughs> Ohio, Ohio. What did I say, Colorado? Yes. Oh, sh I'm losing my freaking mind. That's all right. That's all right. It's a little flatter in Ohio, but uh, you know, I was just watching the TV and saw that Colorado was getting a bunch of snow, so Colorado must have been on my mind. <laughs> you got a Rocky Mountain High going, I think. Nah, <laughs> it must be. Uh, that's good. Uh, Paul, Paul yeah. it's Thanksgiving week, and hey, do we stop doing our podcast? No, we don't. We just keep it going. We don't mess around, you know. We're we're like the post office. We well, maybe I shouldn't use that for a for a reference, but yeah, maybe find say, something better. Yeah, let me just say we we're just like the sun coming up and going down. We do a podcast every week, so you know we're we're onward and upward. So that's good stuff. Yeah, this week and uh, this week and Christmas are usually the the most difficult ones for us to uh, to to wrangle somebody in to come and talk to us. But uh, right. to, today we we've, we've really stumbled on a good one. Um, oh. I'm excited about it. Um, I can I can talk a little bit about him. I've, you, you know, it's it's funny when you say like, oh man, I've known that kid since he was in diapers. But in this situation, I've actually known this kid since he was in diapers. So <laughs> it not only makes me feel old, it it tells you just how long we've uh, we've been friends with the family. And obviously, my father worked with Kenny Roberts um, and helped him win his three world championships. Uh, and now today we have. We are joined on the show by Kenny Roberts Jr., who uh, who won the 500 CC World Championship himself in 2000 on a Suzuki. Uh, it became somewhat newsworthy again um, this uh, past week when Suzuki won the World Championship again in MotoGP. And the last time Suzuki had accomplished that feat was actually with Kenny Roberts Jr., which so 20 years it took uh, it took Suzuki to be able to win that championship again, but they they did so this year. And uh, we we'd already thought about Junior before um, that happened, but the the timing worked out really nice with the fact that uh, that they that Suzuki did win again, and 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 his name was brought up uh, in the news again internationally, and you know on TV they 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 made mention obviously that it was Junior who won the last time for Suzuki, so it's kind of cool. Um, and then obviously before him, it was like Kevin Schwantz and, and that Suzuki's uh, championships haven't, have been obviously few and far between, but they're memorable when they do happen. And I think Junior would agree with us that uh, Suzuki's a pretty tight knit little family and, and it's kind of cool to see them be able to do what they did this year with, with winning that championship. So why don't we bring Junior in now? Uh, how are you, Kenny? Good. Thanks for having me. Come on, be a little more excited. Yeah, it's Thanksgiving for God's sake. Yeah. Well, I'm 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 uh, listening to all this, and yeah, it all sounds. Uh, it's been a short twenty years, I guess. It seems like just yesterday that we were uh, fighting for that thing, and it just uh, yeah, time flies. Like you said, we were. You, you know, earlier we were talking about us when we were younger, and when my dad and your dad started this whole. Uh, trajectory of the you know American uh, basically my dad uh, you know changing the sport and putting it on uh, a trajectory and a path that other Americans could be involved so uh, it's fun to talk about because you remember a lot of the good times and uh, but it does sh shorten the makes life seem like it's going by pretty fast yeah I couldn't imagine that that, that there's no way that seems like it was 20 years ago um, it's funny too, cause I was looking up the old cycle news when we, when we went up to your house, because we cycle news named you as writer of the year that year. So myself and Blake Connor went up there and did a story with you and shot photos. And if somebody would told me that was 20 years, I'd go, I'd be like, you know, what have you been smoking? Cause it, it seems like 10 at the most, <laughs> yeah. but yeah, time exactly. does fly. Yeah. <clears throat> yeah. I remember that article yet. That was a really good article. I think we, there was a little bit of you know, Colin Edwards being the two time, I think at that time it was the, his the second world championship he won in a row or the first. And it was sort of who was going to be the rider of the year and all that stuff. But, you know, you had a, a, a great article in there and 
you know, Colin's a good friend of mine. And, um, you know, so we've been racing together since 92 at least. And yeah, it's just kind of been fun that we all have made it this far and in racing. And then of course you being involved in it as well from the other side is just, uh, yeah, it's a small world. Yeah, you know, speaking, Kenny, of uh, 92, I wanna, that's where I want to start. I don't know if you saw, but this past week on, we do a, I do a Throwback Thursday post for Moto America, and I wrote a story about that 90, 1992 season, which is, you know, the first time I ever met you, it was quite a long time after Paul, and I know you weren't wearing diapers that year, although you were still pretty young. But um, you are the original one that uh, – kind of coined the idea that Paul and I joke about all the time. I don't know if you know this routine that Chris Farley did on Saturday Night Live where he would interview people and he had terrible interviewing skills. So he was interviewing Paul um, McCartney. McCartney. Oh, he was a Beatle. He wasn't interviewing Paul Carruthers. He was interviewing Paul okay. McCartney. And he was talking about and he goes, hey, hey, Paul, he said, you remember when you used to be in the Beatles? And Paul said, yeah, yeah. And he goes, that was cool. Well, I'll never forget at Loudoun in 1992 when I first met you. And I mean, obviously your, your dad is one of the big reasons why I am a huge fan of racing and, and obviously a, a fan of, uh, of GP and MotoGP and all that. So I remember going up to you and I was like, hey, you know, your dad's really cool. I like him. And, and you kind of looked at me and I thought afterwards, yeah, I'm probably about the 300th person that said that. And that was way back in 1992. But how did you deal with people that would just go, try to say something to you about your dad? And it's like, you know, you're trying to make your own life. You, you got your own, your, own, your own career started. But, you know, you have to deal with everybody coming up to you and talking about your dad all the time. Was, was, that, was that tough to, to do? Uh, for me, it wasn't. It, it, yeah. it, for some, you know, yeah. I mean, it, but if you if you start the idea off as that he's not only a, a legend in the sport he paved everything for you know the current American writers and if you think of him as Dale Earnhardt and with Dale Earnhardt and Dale Earnhardt Jr.'s relationship is is very similar to where your dad is as you're young uh, as we all most of us back in those days were our heroes if they you know if we looked up to them and you had a good relationship with them no matter what they did if doctor lawyer etc so i always had held my dad as a hero to within the sport and also wanted to emulate it now if he would have raised nascars i would have done nascars i mean that's a not a not a very event for the motorcycle industry but as a kid and my how impressionable I was. I just wanted to be, you know, 500 CC world champion because that's what he was. Wow. So I, I always took it as a compliment. And to this day, you know, it's still when I, you know, in, in areas where I get recognized by the name, I go out on this, the second of the two, you're probably thinking of my dad in the seventies and 90% of the time, that's the case. You know, the Kenny Roberts is, is you know him as opposed to who they're and they're, then their second response is oh yeah because you look quite young <laughs> for, for right. what i remember right. so but yeah no i it was always for me it was always you know i the comparison never really i'm never going to be as good as him on the track i i don't really feel even when we rode together that i was probably at his level of what he could ride that nobody could ride meaning you know the tz 750s and just warming that thing up the brass uh slides and the carburetors i think like two and a half pound full uh, and you get arm pump just warming the thing up on the stand so <laughs> right. you know having to race stuff like that and i think that you know we've been trying to preserve some of the stuff with him um because i i feel that there needs to be more history wrote about him and even, um, you know, Kel and everybody that was involved in that process, because without my dad, the trajectory of American motorcycle racing does not exist. You, you know, it, it, and this is, this is not meant to be bad, but Eddie's not there. Wayne is not there in the same, in the same way that they were. 
Right. But if you take Eddie or Wayne or one of those people out, the trajectory is the same because it, you know, Americans are still going over there, but it all started from my dad and Kel and how it, how it paved the way for people that didn't speak anything but, you know, English at the time to get to Europe. That's right. And it was a very different time, you know, in the seventies, you didn't have Google and FaceTime and, you know, I, I mean, I've heard stories of you know, not being able to call home because, you know, all the phone lines were taken up for overseas and, you know, the operators and there's no open lines. I mean, that is it, such a different era that they, and especially what he did it in with, um, you know, being the first guy. So yeah. it, you look back at, at it now with more appreciation at least I do as I get older and then I see, you know, my kids raised with electronics and the ability to just reach out and get any, get any answer for homework or anything in a blink of a second. And, you know, back in the day, you know, just trying to get a Euro uh, motor home from Italy to France must've been, you know, logistically a bit of a feat. Well, this is a different angle for you. So what I was, one of the things that about back then that I, I, I think I even talked to you about this the first time I met you, but it, um, so the situation with your dad, what happened with me was a little different because when I was in college, the advertising that Yamaha did during that time period was done by an ad agency called Chiat Day, who also did Apple's ads back in the, when the Mac first came out. So they're the ones that did that commercial where the woman runs down between that group of people and throws the sledgehammer through the screen and, and introduced the Macintosh. Well, they did all Yamaha's ads and they were iconic ads featuring your dad. And the, the mm. writing and the headlines were so good in it that, that I became a fan of your dad from the ads. And I actually decided to have a career in advertising as a copywriter because of those ads. So I kind of attribute Kenny Roberts as a reason that my career kind of ended up, ended up the way it did in advertising. And now it's circled back to being involved in Moto America and and working with Paul, but um, it's kind of a, a weird connection for me. Um, it's beyond, almost beyond motorcycles. You know, it's, it's, it's really all about things that your dad did. So it's iconic in that way. Yeah, he, right. He had that, I mean, you know, it's, it's simple. Show me, you know, one other MotoGP world champion uh, that I, certainly that I, I don't know of that has a telegram, a telegram of, you know, a sitting president, which was Ronald Reagan, you know, congratulating him on his career and his retirement from the sport. Wow. And, you know, that just let that sink in for a minute. I mean, that's, you know, he was racing when, you know, Reagan was saying, tear down this wall and that type of, or he was in that environment, you know, he was team owner or whatever here would have been. So he, he made quite a bit of impressions on, you know, a lot of people. And he had a lot of resistance. There was, you know, a lot of the FIM and, you know, the powers at play that were taking for granted most of the riders at the time. Um, and again, with Paul and Kel and my dad, these stories of, you know, rider pay and the track safety and how they were just, you know, it's so different. And he changed a lot of that. So I'm not surprised with you with just, you know, the, the press side of it because he was, you know, the first one to really, you know, grab the sport like you did and take it to new levels, a lot of different ways. Kenny, I think one of the things that's different about you compared to a lot of American racers that, that had success in Europe is, you know, you, you kind of came on as a, as a, you didn't, you didn't, you weren't two or three years old or four years old, like some of these motocross kids, but I, you were probably, I don't know, seven or eight or whatever. And you started racing a YSR 50. And then next thing we knew you're on a 250 and you did a, a maybe a year or two of wear racing. And then you only did one year of AMA 250 racing, and then you're off to Europe. So your, your fan base didn't really get to develop at a young age. When you were here, your fan base, basically evolved when you're already in Europe because that's when when you actually started to make a name for yourself was when you when you got to Europe and that seems a lot different than any other path where normally the the kid becomes you know semi famous or famous in his home country and then goes to Europe you just kind of got wished off right away and and didn't get the opportunity to do a lot of racing here you i i don't think you have you you've never even ridden or raced a superbike at all right uh, yeah, that's, it's, it's definitely, 
the other end of the spectrum for the way that I was brought up in racing and and was able to to have the opportunity I mean without of course my dad then you know I wouldn't have never had the opportunity to have any of this obviously and of course I wanted to follow in his footsteps so it essentially like you said you know where at AMA uh, and then I went to Europe to the 250 stuff and Colin who I was competing with here stayed and did you know for Yamaha in the U.S. so he did all the superbike stuff I had done um, uh, an eight hour with Kevin McGee who broke his hand that year I think it was I want to say it was uh, 93 or 94 right in there with with that I'd have to look back on it with Kevin that was about the only superbike um, you know, practice or that I'd ever done. And the difference between it, between a super bike and a 500 was just at that time was so night and day. And the, the 500s are so scary, the tire technology and, you know, we're always on the, on the edge with these things. And it was just very difficult to stay at the limit and not fall down. And then at the time when I was progressing through the sport, you know, the padding and, I broke my tib fib in Malaysia in ninety um, in ninety six, and you know the boot was just the sole with the leather going straight up the side. There was no protection or anything, so everything has come a long way. But we were, you know, the five hundreds were getting the hardest to ride, and <clears throat> the protection was the least amount still. So there was obviously a fine line as you know two thousand six comes along to where Alpine Star started to you know get the air ladders and stuff in there so we were riding the bikes when you know former world champions were in wheelchairs we had fused ankles we had fused wrists with Kevin you know you your chances of getting off of these things and in my what my dream was to get off and still be able to play soccer and basketball and squash and racquetball and all the fun things that I enjoyed doing for training so you know I was I was lucky but it, it wasn't a very good percentage of people that were stopping um, with any success, uh, you know, able to physically do what they felt like doing after the fact. Yeah, well, that, that, that brings me to your retirement, because a lot of people probably thought that came pretty early. Was, was that a case of, of, of not wanting to get hurt? I mean, were you tired of it? Did it lose its appeal? Um, did you accomplish what you wanted to do and then, and then just wanted to go away and be with the family and the kids and, and do that deal? Or, I mean, how did that, how did that so, come about? Yeah. The, and, you know, I'll touch on both questions. I, 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 you know, touched on the one that you'd asked previously with the families and with the, you know, with my, I, I had a lot of support for my dad, obviously. I, he said he wanted it done a certain way and I always was very professional from the standpoint of working out and diet and everything that I needed to do. And then of course he, he was always, you know, we never had any issues. He, what he said was sort of written in stone and I just did what he requested and thought who, who better to listen to. I remember, you know, funny story is John Michelle Bell came in in 96 and I was told never to clutch a 500 and he's clutching the 500 out of first gear. And I'm, <clears throat> that's like a cardinal sin for me and I'm like hey you can't do that my dad says <laughs> you know we're having this argument in this garage and he's trying to ride it like a motocross bike with the throttle you know open and the clutch dragging and that was like uh you know something that I had uh had been set in stone for me and I just you know couldn't imagine even trying to do it and 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 then he couldn't imagine me telling him not to do it so it was this funny sort of time uh that we we were having but um you know, once I got over to Europe, I didn't get on many bikes for a long period of time. I mean, I went right from a 250, got uh, a humerus fracture, same as Marquez right now in 93, and wasn't basically healed until 95, and then uh, was on the 500 in 96. And uh, Mick Dewan at that time said that I was, of all the up-and-coming guys, I was the guy that he thought had the most ability to have success and then I was Modena in 98 99 to Suzuki at 99 and we basically took that bike and uh, you know rode that bike until 2001. Um, I, I know that 
we tested some of Kevin's crankshafts and we had all kinds of different things that had been, you know, from the 93 bike. So essentially we, you know, we wanted on the ability to ride the thing and, and stay consistent. And um, with the tires at that time, 17 inch, they didn't have a lot of side grip for acceleration. So we were able to use the amount of horsepower we had to get down to the ground and Hondas would, would spin in their, in their first, you know, three, four bike lengths. So, we could go forward and that just gave us that little bit of an edge 2001 obviously you know the, the rider myself was complaining that we're not going to be competitive and the factory um obviously never believes you know the rider to a certain extent and it's an economical at that point <clears throat> we were we were done basically halfway through 2000 we that was uh that that bike had improved from that point on um meaning we had nothing coming from the research and development side to help us with anything so we knew that that was our only shot and then 2001 just sort of rode around <clears throat> and then we got into the four stroke era and we thought we had the right factory for that but as honda showed you know they just dominated the the sport and, you know, had things, you know, had people thinking they were going to have a three cylinder and they came out with a five cylinder and conveniently the weight was the same as a four cylinder because nobody believed there was going to be a five cylinder. You know, just a lot of fun little things that happened during that time. So I, when I stopped, we were traveling because of the schedule every Tuesday, my wife, Rochelle and I were traveling either to Europe or from Europe, pretty much the last part of 2006. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, Wednesday jet lag and Thursday and then Friday, Saturday, Sunday at the track, test possibly Monday and then come back on Tuesday. Now, <clears throat> I was set up in 2007 for what we thought was going to be an amazing year because the 1000cc Honda motor was the best motor that I've ever ridden in my life uh, and I know that they had a couple thousand horsepower more than what we were allowed to have since we were not an HRC rider because I got Mickey's uh, engine map and and rev limiter setting at the last race in Valencia by Valencia by accident for the first practice where I was like a second quicker than anybody and they were they came and they messed up so I went from 18.8 or whatever it was to 16.6 um but it, that was a difference in first through third year and the first through fifth year at the track. So we had reduced power, both uh, wheelie and traction control and power output by about 20% Laguna 2006. So that was about the reduction we thought the 800 would have. So we thought we were going to, with the new chassis and all that, we were going to really be able to compete for a championship. But the Honda motor that came out um, was just a flop for some reason. Uh, you know, they never really got it going and that, that whole year of Mickey's, what would have been Mickey's championship season after he won the championship, right? So he sort of struggled all year as well. One of the things I wanted to point out, um, Kenny, about your career that's interesting is, you, of course, you won the championship in 2000, which for people that think of milestones, that was uh, Valentino Rossi's rookie year in Moto, Moto, well, 500 at that time. And he was your greatest challenge that year. So you, you know, you think about how, well, for Yamaha anyway, that, that, uh, Valentino said goodbye to the factory team this year, but so it was a little bit of a milestone, but it's, it was interesting when we were thinking about this podcast with you to think back that, wow, you know, Kenny was right there at the beginning of Valentino's career. Um, what, what was he like as a rookie? Did you, did you get to know him pretty, pretty early on? And, you know, obviously. I, yeah, I knew, I knew. Yeah. I knew all the guys. I mean, you know, Max and <clears throat> you know, I, I was sort of neutral. I was sort of Switzerland because, you know, I had no press. <laughs> Uh, we had no, you know, not a home race. We didn't, there was no aggression with, you know, the Italians versus the, each other or the Spanish versus Italians. You know, it was, this has been going for thousands of years, not only on the racetrack, but hundreds of years on the racetrack. But I mean, you know, the, 
difference between Italy and Spain and, and just history itself is, you know, just different than what we are. So <clears throat> I could go up to Max and talk to Max and I could go two feet over and talk to Valentino, but those two wouldn't go, wouldn't even look at each other. <laughs> so, you know, it was, it was quite complex and something I never really, you know, sort of got in the middle of. Valentino was always going to, I mean, I remember, you know, having conversations and I'm not going to mention names of the other Italian riders, but they were much happier to see me win the championship in 2000 than Valentino. But we had, you know, uh, like the series with, with, uh, you know, Michael Jordan, who I personally know, and I think had similar traits to all of us champions. I mean, it's funny to watch that documentary. It's like, that's the exact same thing you had to do to be world champion. You know, it's the guy, you know, it just looks a little different because he's on a team and it's not, you know, one person, but um, we had serious talks, my dad and I, and it's like, man, this is, this is the only shot. I mean, we, when the bike sees the first lap in, in Holland, that, that was sort of scary because we, we knew that we weren't in 2001, we were going to have no shot at this um, because we, we, we were just getting away with keeping these guys at bay. The tire technology had started to come in in 2000 uh, towards the end with Gary McCoy on the 16 fives, which the super bike uh, Colin and these guys were getting better and better. So each time they pushed the 16 five on us, it was a better tire. And at the end, I was the last guy to win a race on a 17 inch tire. And that was in Motegi, Japan, uh -huh. uh, where I ran off after the, the Brazilian Grand Prix, the, the race before. So um, once that 16.5 had its side grip, the Honda was open and the throttle sooner and the bike was jumping that initial two or three bike lengths right out of the corner and we were done. And we were just holding on to the lead that we had acquired through the season. <clears throat> you know, so I wanted you know, by darn near 50 points. And then, you know, the Holland race was a disaster because I was two or three seconds faster in the wet and it was coming in. Uh, and unfortunately I didn't make it, you know, we didn't, we, we had a problem with the pistons and the shape of the pistons um, were identified wrong real early on by my teammate because he would downshift and it would over rev and the bike would seize. So thankfully, uh, GP Motorsports, who, you know, my dad's guys were working in conjunction with the factory at the time. And there was already a fix coming from the factory, but this, we had known about this problem in, well, this would have been March. So the bike seized roughly around July on the first lap due to temperature changes with the motor warming up too fast. And so we luckily had a fix for those pistons within the next round. And it was just a simple change to the shape, but it takes quite a little, you know, quite a long time to, to confirm all that. So we, we were under no illusion that Valentino wasn't going to just dominate. I mean, I remember talking to him specifically in the car after the press release or the press conference we had on, on Friday night in Phillip Island because I'm like, well, what's the deal with the bike? Because it sounds totally different. It looks totally different than every other Honda. And it goes, oh, that's next year's bike. And it, it had different air intakes. So it sounded really throaty. And uh, I said, how is it? He goes, oh, it's, it's, it's as good. And it's already next year's bike. So he raced that in Phillip Island. And we wow. all know the history after that. So yeah, I mean, I, I'm also one of the last generation of riders that could build my bike. I mean, if it was like, we often joke, like, it'd be great just to have to come in and have to change your own tires and brake pads. And, you know, of course, I would have to do more work because we'd have to do squish tests and O-rings and blah, 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 or, you know, base gaskets to get the right compression. And, you know, the Honda, they're just throwing cylinders from one bike to another bike on these things. No compression tests, no they're it's just identical so we had a lot you know a lot of late nights where you'd you'd uh be in the suzuki garage and we'd hear like a 22 go off and it's like oh find the hole in the fairing 
where did that bolt come from? And then you'd have to find out which head flew off <laughs> and then make sure they, you know, put it back and put another one back in. So th that wasn't an abnormal thing. Wow. Um, boy, you think yeah, I mean, we, we could, we could go in for hours and hours into this type of, you know, wormhole with, with R and D and how we did things, you know, this would just, for most people, it would bore the people, uh, but unlike me, I watch a NASCAR race because I want to hear about the cars, the yes. technology. Yes. And if, so for me, it's natural. And I have a lot of wealth of that. And so did my dad and, you know, building his own chassis and stuff on his team and all that. But that's a, you know, a hidden, it's gone now, you know, that'll never happen again. Junior, do you pay attention to MotoGP? Do you watch it all the time or you or not? Well, um, yeah, long answer is yes. Short answer this year, I'm a huge. I'm a huge fan of people that do it right and put the respect in. And I think every writer now pretty much does it right. Um, you know, I think that when I say right, I mean the amount of, energy and you know the I mean I had trainers and chefs and I was I was given a very good platform because of my dad but I didn't take it for granted from the standpoint of well I have talent I mean I could ride a bike fast but for me three percent is a big deal on a 500 and that three percent coming from you know the extra hours at the gym or you know, just the ability to go out and for two hours, and for me, it would be playing squash. And I, my heart rate's 185 beats a minute on average with five minute water breaks every half an hour for two hours. And I mean, I, it was just an animal for uh, in that, in that range of 210 heart rates of 215, 212 was not, was not getting into a, a, a bad range. That was, a range that we would anaerobically get into and I would stay at, you know, on the bike probably in one sixties at the last couple of laps, but certainly one forty to one fifty somewhere in there. <clears throat> so when I look at the riders now, they're all very professional. They're all treating this, you know, because it's gotten so professional from the standpoint of um, you know, how public it is with the press and social media and all that. So on that side, it's really good. I was just really disturbed when, when Mark got hurt because, you know, you look at this guy and you just go, that's my dad, basically, for me, meaning he can ride something that nobody else can and just make everybody look like they don't know what they're doing. Mm -hmm. Now, I think, you know, Valentino had some of that um, when he was in his prime. He certainly had some competition from Alex Barros on the same machinery, you know, at certain times and other guys that they, for example. But if you look at Marquez, you know, for me as a rider, I think putting him on anything, he's a cut above everybody. And, you know, just a simple little fall like that. And then, you know, the tire getting as humorous is just sort of a, you know, with a, with a fun year we've had with this 2020 in general. <laughs> I've just been sort of, all right, let me see what happened in the results and maybe watch the race quickly. But uh, before that, you know, I was trying to stay involved in the uh, side of the machinery as much as possible. Right. How much, how developed were the electronics by the time you'd, you'd quit on the, on the four stroke? I mean, compared to where they are now, it's nowhere close, huh? Um, there are a couple stories. And, you know, I know you guys are time is obviously um, what you what you need to pay attention to. But the funny parts of it were <clears throat> we uh, in the factory that I rode for in 2000, we went to Mitsubishi and said we need a new, you know, uh, electronic system, you know, attraction, blah, 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 all the stuff for the two stroke. And, you know, it was a it was always a money problem. And you know, well, what you guys want us to build is not even the same as the 92 Honda for power. And it's going to cost you a third of the, or three quarters of the price. So why don't you just buy the current model, 
well, we didn't have enough budget, so we couldn't do that. So we were always running into budget things like that. So if you fast forward to 2004, uh, 2003, when Gary Taylor had, had uh, been let go and then Paul Denning coming in, we, we had, the, the factory had total belief that they had superior four-stroke technology. And when Honda came out and they're testing the bikes and the bikes are going by, and I'm like, what's that? And they're going, oh, that's a speed limit. Uh, since, you know, it regulates the speed limit. And I'm like, we don't have that. And we didn't have wheelie control. We didn't have traction control. We didn't have any of these things that were already standard on the Honda, whether you were HRC or not. And then we just got, I mean, some of the scariest times I remember being on a motorcycle, besides the 500 of being on the the limit like i could ride one of the if you guys look at it moto gp uh, i think they asked 10 riders who is the fastest guy they've ever raced in the ring and three including marquez named me i think creville one other person and and marquez even though we never even raced against each other in the ring because i could hit my line within a foot whether it was wet or dry or whatever so for me i could put on slicks and run out and as long as I had a, a good foot to work with, I could do the same lap time in a completely wet track with a foot dry line. Because I never missed my, on a 500, you couldn't. You never got off the line and open the throttle. You just die. Mm. Yeah. <laughs> so I was so, you know, I was so disciplined in that, in that area because you basically, you know, on these 500s in 95, 6, 7, 8 and there, you just made one little mistake and, you know, we were seeing big injuries of, you know, look at Alberto Pooge and, you know, check on these guys, you know, everybody was getting collarbones and ankles and, you know, all kinds of stuff. So again, we were at, we were at a stage to where the bikes were so fast and had so much grip until they didn't. And the riders were getting subjected to these vicious high sides and, and mistakes that we would look at the computer and ah, same corner speed, same lean angle as the lap before, but this time it let go. So you had to be so disciplined. And when we got in, as we evolved, we got to 2004, uh, we didn't have any of these electronics. We had to flip the engines ourselves and the gearbox had a, a lot of stress on it. And if the tolerances aren't just right, when you have that amount of stress, I remember having a back shift in England uh, to get it from six to first, like six or seven times. Mm. And if you didn't just get the timing down just right, and my arm was dead, you know, with, with um, arm pump. So I, you know, went to the factory. I'm like, look, guys, I got to get my arm fit, or we got to get this gearbox. You got the auto blip on it. Ah, please fix your arm. Okay. <laughs> so <laughs> I had a couple of week holiday because, you know, they, there was nothing in sight. Now, if you, if you want to hear a great story and how, the, how this stuff evolved, then 2005, the 2004, 2005, when I think John was my teammate for the first year, they brought to the last race the auto blip, uh, traction control, and all this stuff for us to try on the Monday or the Tuesday, whichever day it was the test, because I think Monday was the day off. But anyway, I'm like, okay, just put it on now. It, we're going to get 14th and 16th or we're going to get 14th and 16th with all this stuff on. What is it? Why, why wait? You know, it's, Oh no, no, we must, you know, we got a certain protocol. So, all right, whatever. So they put the thing on Tuesday and I go out of the pits and I grab the front brake and I downshift and you, you know, you hear the engine. Oh, no, no, no. oh, wow. That's way better. But it would lift the front off the ground a little bit because it was set too high. And it's like, okay, well, just be aware of that because you can tuck the front like super easy, you know, third or fourth gear. If you go back, it'll lift the front off the ground and you'll just, you know, because you're on the brakes, you'll just tuck the front. So I did three or four installation laps and perfect. This thing is good. The traction control, I can feel it's starting to, as I open my throttle, it was starting to make some noise and okay, this is all seeming good. Now I had tested traction control in 2000, sorry, in 1990 six in Jerez on a 500 with my dad's team 
and they were fighting with Yamaha on who's going to have the traction control work the best. So Yamaha had a, a ignition-based traction control that let the crank only accelerate at a given rate. So if it tried to accelerate faster than that, that meant it was going to high side the rider, so it would cut spark. Team Roberts was based off a of wheel speed. So the front wheel speed and the rear wheel speed had to match. And if they started to get an anomaly, that would cut traction that way as well, right? So they go, okay, we need you to go try this. So they put a light on the dash and I'm like, okay, what's that? And they're like, well, if that turns red, it's not working. So the joke was like, okay, I'm going in her res, like the worst, you know, first gear to point and shoot track in the world. And if there's a little mistake, I'm going to be full throttle in first gear. So it's not going to be pretty. And the joke was, well, what happened? And I'm in the hospital going, I just saw a red light. I have no idea. Uh. <laughs> that was the sort of joke going around. So in, in, you know, fast forward 2004, yeah, yeah, I've done this before. I mean, this is 10 years old of stuff. We've been doing this since 95, 96. So here we are 2004 and they're just, how is it? It's traction control. It just turn it up or down. It's working fine. It's taken us a year and a half to get this. So anyway, they, I come in and they're, okay, you know, can I please try now, you know, more hard pace? Okay, well, we took off the old tires and put on brand new tires. <clears throat> and, you know, people who design this stuff, you would think <clears throat> at, the, at the factory we were with that they would, uh, you know, have had people test riding these things. And, you know, like, like Honda, for example, had their five cylinder on the track a year before they even were switching to four stroke. And, you know, this thing's putting through the process. I mean, they have to have four or five customer bikes and, uh, you know, four factory bikes, right? So we were quite the opposite. So a lot of the times, you know, the test riders, even when they're tested, they're four or five seconds off the pace. So it, it's, when it gets to us, it's still very rough. So the engineers are there and they but we put new tires on and I go out and I am in Valencia and go in the last corner and the last corner is like twice as wide as it needs to be on the entrance. So we always, as riders, go way out. And then we come through the last corner, like third gear instead of first or second, depending on what bike you're on. So we're carrying a lot more corner speed through that corner, but you get a good lap time from that, you know, having more straightaway speed. But you never take that line in a race because you, you'll just, everybody will go up the inside of you because it's the slowest way into the corner, right? Well, as I go out there, I grab the front brake and the thing just wheelies and just takes off the track and I am falling off the back. And of course, I had shut the bike off a couple of times that year because, you know, that we put the kill switch on the other side. Because once we, once we knew traction control was coming, we had to put that on the left side. So the kill switch is on the right side and I can't get to it because it's wide open. I got the gun and I'm trying to get to the clutch, but I'm falling off the back of the bike. And I get it to about 100 yards or so into the gravel, and somehow I stay on it and get it stopped before the fence, and I've got the clutch pulled in, and the bike is full throttle, and just buried itself in the sand, and I finally, at that point, I'm able to hit the power switch off, and the bike dies, and I'm like, Phew. throttle stuck, obviously. And so I go into the pits, and I say, you know, things in the beach, and the throttle stuck. The Japanese are, oh, impossible. I'm like, well, okay. Anyway, when you look back on the data and you see that it's 100%, it's out there in the sand, so whatever. I mean, I, I don't care. I just know something is wrong. So hours are going by, and we get to lunch, nothing. I'm like, all right, so I guess I don't have to test anymore today because this is obviously nothing's coming from the factory. And, uh, you know, Kim's on so good braking, and it's like, well, okay, whatever, that's it. And, you know, there was a couple of comments like that I've made and, and about two or three in the afternoon, it's getting dark there in Valencia at that time, we stop at four and I'm like, okay, guys, what, what's going on? Ah, oh, Kenson, so good braking. I'm like, okay, I know this is the fifth time I've been told that what happened with the bike. Ah, uh, so it seems like so good braking, but anyway, pressure is so high. I'm like, okay, what happened? Just show me the data. So we finally look at the data. Well, the throttles were open 100% because on a, on a bike with carbon fiber brakes, you grab the brakes and there's nothing there. That's normal. We as riders know that. So we grab it, pull it as hard as you can. You let it go. 
you pull it again, and then guess what? After the second time, you've got breaks. That's typical. Well, the computer doesn't know that. So the computer's going, holy smokes, he's pulling the brakes super hard. We better give him a lot of throttle for corner entry. Oh, wow. Because you know, they don't want the – exactly. So <laughs> the idea is that you run off into the corner like a two-stroke. So as you break, you know, let's say 10 bar or whatever PSI, it'll give you 10% throttle. So the back wheel doesn't try to get out of line. Well, the computer engineer is going, well, at that amount of brakes, give them everything we got. <laughs> so – the end result is me grabbing the brake hard and the bike taking off wheeling through into the crack. Mm. And I'm like, guys, guys, what was the maximum, the first run, the maximum, the fly, the butterfly, the electronic, you know, butterflies opened up uh, 8%. Okay. Let's make it never possible to go above 8% ever again. And they're like, Oh, do you think that's a good idea? I'm like, no, I, I just don't want to die. That's a perfect idea. Since it was picking up the front wheel at 8%, let's not go over that. So those are the type of things, you know, we, you know, are behind the scenes that, I mean, for, and that's 2004. I mean, you know, the championship, the cylinders are blowing off on the front straight. The, every time in Brazil, for some reason, we had to have fast reads because the carbon fiber ones would just annihilate themselves. So I finished the, both races in 2000 and 2001 on three cylinders. Um, yeah, we just, I mean, we had adventures every weekend. Yeah. Wow. And hey, Kenny, so, you know, that, you. That, anyway. I want, Kenny, let me ask you, I know we're running, we're running out short on time and I have, I have three questions I want to rapid fire try to get out to you, but we'll have to obviously have you on again and talk to you some more. So real quick, here's one I want to ask you. This is pretty broadly reaching, but do you, to this day, do you prefer two strokes to four strokes? Prefer the safety of the riders in the current form, I guess it is. So it, it, there's nothing more disappointing than, you know, turning on your sports thing and this person you're looking at is hurt and out, right? So right. I think for the safety and everything that you would have to lean towards the current. Could mm. you take Mark Marquez and put him on a TZ750 and he would ride the hell out of it? And, you know, the amazing thing about him, and I've made this, this up myself, which is he's, you know, He's the only guy I know in the history of the sport that'll go in and push the front and go, I just push the front. And I say to my elbow, let me try. Oh yeah. The front's definitely going bad. Yeah. It's doing it again. He has the memory of a goldfish. Meaning if I did that, I'd be like, Phew, get in and change this tire. But mm -hmm. he has the ability to just forget it and push the same you know, pace the whole race and saving the front and, you know, spinning the thing out. And I prefer that. Although, you know, back in the day, the 500s were something special that you, uh, when you found the limit, nothing else in the world was like it, but the potential for injury was high. Yeah. I, you know, you just wonder, they talk about the technology of two strokes and whether or not, you know, will two strokes ever make a return? Just the fact of the simple simplicity of them, not in, in a general terms of simplicity, but kind of wondering if, you know, with technology, can they advance it to the point where two strokes emissions wise and everything could come back into this scene again? They talk about direct injection and all kinds of things. What do you, what do you think? Do you think two strokes are done or? I think you're a hundred percent. I think you're a hundred percent right. I think that they, they can prove that the emissions are, first of all, emissions and racing don't mix. Well, in my true. opinion, but right. yeah, but, but the sound of a 500 around Phillip Island and some of these tracks is just music. Mm -hmm. And I think just on that alone, people would love to see them back. And I, I know that um, there's a couple companies or at least one company that's, you know, have, have it all fuel injected. And I want to even say that they've got, uh, 200 and something horsepower out of the thing. So power to weight ratio and all that, 225 horsepower, power to weight ratio, I think is quite good. So I would, I would love to see it as long as they can, you know, keep the safety, you know, to where we're not seeing these guys getting, you know, high side and, you know, and out of the season. Right. Uh, like we used to. Yeah. All right. Here's another question. Uh, so, when I think about you in your career, of course, the early days, I think of you with Yamaha, then of course, riding your dad's bike with, with Suzuki there as well. In my head, I know that you won the championship on a Suzuki, but it's it still, to me, 
it, it, I have to think about it and remember that when you were younger and you were dreaming about winning a 500 CC championship, did you ever think that you would win it on a Suzuki? No, the typical thought was, you know, just to carry <clears throat> through with, with Wayne's because that was, yes. you know, my very impressionable time and Kaczynski, of course, um, you know, lived near us. So the conventional wisdom was, was that route. Mm -hmm. um, and then in 97, basically what happened in 90 was Aguma had made a motor, which was formerly with Honda. And if his motor that we debuted in a test with the Modena, so my dad's bike wasn't out of the box a second faster, which we needed, then, uh, you know, we had, it, it had the crank go in the different direction and we had, a, you know, basically a small Honda copy, essentially. <clears throat> and it, that, that was the point to where if I wasn't a second faster on the first lap, then I knew we were going to go, I, my only option was Suzuki with, you know, Warren had went there, Gary Taylor had shown interest. But you have to remember when I was, when I was there, we think of another factory that has changed suspension middle of the season because the rider, you know, as in myself, said we'd never win another race. I mean, we had done things at that factory from 99 to 2000 that would just blow your mind. I mean, mm. Warren could see stiction on the show of suspension, and we had the ability to go around the corner faster than the Honda and open the throttle sooner because we had 180 horsepower. My 1995 Yamaha had 185 horsepower at the same RPM range at 10,000 RPM. It had 15 more horsepower than the, the bike, you know, we were on. Mm. And so <clears throat> we knew that we, we could get around the corner faster and open the throttle sooner. That was our only advantage. So Warren was able to push the testing of Olean suspension and I think I, I, you'd have to go back and look. I think a 203 was the fastest I'd done all weekend in the Czech Republic. But Warren had a couple, uh, um, he had a couple headsets made for the suspension, for the front suspension, triple clamps, et cetera. And, he, you know, he came to me on Monday and he's like, okay, we're going to put these in right off the bat, right? I'm like, I don't care. We can do whatever you want. So, I just knew that we were going to be faster and I was going to make sure of that. So the test starts on Tuesday morning and I went out and we had the Olean suspension in and this was after the Czech Republic race. And I went out, I did a 2027, uh, four or five times in a row, came in, parked the bike and said, we won't win another race this season if we don't have these, this suspension. And I left. But there was no need for me to test. I'm just going to go faster on something we can't have. So it didn't, didn't matter. So I left the test and we showed up the next race in Phillip Island with a full lean suspension on the front. And I dominated the race only at practice. Apparently, according to McDoin, we had picked a tire that wouldn't last three or four laps on a Honda. We didn't know that. Our, the tires, we had two tires that were within a tenth of a second of each other. And I was a second faster than anybody in the race. So we just went with what we thought was the right choice. And, you know, Mick was like, we could have never ran that tire. They should have known better. Okay, again, we got one rider. <laughs> I've never had another teammate on the podium. <laughs> We're doing things on the Suzuki. We're running all leans front suspension, show a rear suspension. You know, sorry if we don't have all of our tire protocols right. Wow. Yeah. So they did that delaminated the rear tire. Um, and Showa came to do a suspension overhaul on the rear suspension uh, that evening. And then... Warren came in later that night and said, show it, took back all the shocks. And I'm like, so we got no rear suspension for South Africa? He's like, no, I've got a buddy that can make a link and I'll get a super bike at the local store here and we can run that to get us by. And then that overheated in <laughs> South oh. Africa. And uh, I had to retire from that race. Wow. So, yeah, I mean, we, you know, we, we were racing the riders, you know, we were racing, I was racing a factory at one hand with Valentino coming up, but we were racing our factory too. You know, we were having to, we had no time. We didn't have years to make this bike better. We had a very small window, which you see how fast it closes. And depending on how you think this year, um, 
you know, it's a very different year. And uh, this, you know, the, the way that the championship was won this year, you know, that team was very um, consistent. And however the season was put together, it's the most consistent they've ever been since 93 with Barros and Kevin. Mm. I mean, Alex was winning races and fighting for podiums along with Kevin. Um, I never had a, a rider on the podium in 99 and 2000 other than myself. Well, and that goes, that goes a long way to explain how the, 90, the 2000 season and the 2001 season were so dramatically different from each other then. That's incredible. Um, that there was that much change going on during that era. Well, the, the Honda, the Honda did not, for some reason, Yamaha and Honda that in my opinion, spend the money correctly from the factory downward. They, they don't take getting beat lightly when there doesn't seem to be as much. Um, <clears throat> they're not getting, they're getting beat with qu equipment. That's not, you know, trying to nicely say it, it, it's, it's, it's basically competing, not wanting to dominate. And HRC wants to dominate. They mm -hmm. don't, they're an engine company. They want their best engine. I mean, look at from one year, how embarrassed they were to the next year with Marquez from the speed of the Ducati to the, to, to not this year, but the last year. I mean, the thing was horribly slow. And within one year, it's faster than the Ducati the next year passing them on the straightaway. Um, that's a tremendous amount of, it's not a money thing. Again, you know, in motorcycle racing, I have a really good friend that runs the 48 and 88 team for uh, Rick Hendrick Motorsports. They don't have a budget. They do not have an engine budget. So think of that for a minute. <laughs> yeah. Everything with Suzuki our whole time was about budget. Couldn't spend this, couldn't do that. It was always around budget. So it's difficult to tell a guy like me who committed everything in my life to be world champion that there's a budget problem. It just doesn't, that doesn't make sense to me. I mean, I was, I was buying stuff that had to be bought. I was giving Gary Taylor authorization for new tire warmers and things that are, would help us. And if the factory had anything to say, they could say it to me. Wow. I mean, that doesn't happen. I, we, we had handshake deals on my contracts. So, you know, I, <clears throat> they had to buy Showa suspension back from Showa to build a replica bike for me in my first race winning machine in 99 <laughs> because it was in my contract because we did so well. I, re I negotiated my 2001 and 2002 contract in the middle of the 2000 season. And I wanted my first 99 bike because I had to go back yeah. to Showa. And that was some expensive uh, <laughs> suspension because, you know, they had to beg them to get, so, cause the, the bike was set up exactly like my Malaysia, you know, first race winning bike, the shims, the springs, the oil, every single setting in the suspension, gearbox, jetting, everything. Wow. Hey, one of the things I want to ask you about um, before we wrap it up here, just real quick, is, you know, because we are Moto America and we're the AM, AMA sanctioned representative of racing in this country, I want to talk about that 1992 season real quick that I wrote a story about last week. And I wanted to understand a couple of things. So, you know, I talked to Wayne last week and he, he reminded me that it was called Rainy Racing. And I said, yeah, I know it wasn't just Atsuka Electronics. I, I know it had a Rainy Racing uh, logo on it. So... With that in mind, I wanted to ask you what it was like to race for during that season with Wayne. And he told me that Bubba Schobert was involved. And also, I, I'm trying to remember who your teammate was. Was it Jimmy Felice that raced with you that year? Or were you a, a rider of one on that team? No, it was, you would ask me that. Uh, yeah, sorry. My tongue now. <laughs> oh, it was Alan Scott, wasn't it? Uh, Al, not Alan it, Carter. Alan Scott? Alan Scott. Yeah, Alan Scott. Alan Scott, yeah. You have okay. to look back on it, but... Boy, I don't so even remember that. Basi wow. So basically, the... Kaczynski, how quickly my... My... You know, from the time I said to my dad I wanted to race was when John won Sears Point by like 10 seconds or something. Or a minute, you know, something, you know, crazy. And so, well, he, and he said, well, if you're going to do it, you're going to do it the right way. And I'm like, whatever that takes. So I started when I was 17 and I did 
I think six or eight wear a races, never, um, never won a race, got in the top three, you know, several of the times. And then in 92 with Wayne, Sandy was his, my mechanic, which was Wayne's dad. Yep. Then Bubba had, you know, was, was, was um, coming back after his injury. And he, you know, Bubba is one of them guys that I still talk to this day and just love. I never get to spend enough time with Bubba. We spent some, spent some time living in Texas and predominantly to be around Bubba. But um, at that time he was running the team and I'm sure at 17, I was probably not, you know, I, my only focus was to get to Europe. So I think that was all just a stepping stone for me. But I, I've, I did, I never finished a race that I wasn't on the podium. Colin won the championship that year. And then we both raced at Super Prestigio that year in Spain. And then the next year I was gone. So I had only probably done 13 races before mm -hmm. I was racing the, the European championship. So I never had a lot of experience. Um, you know, people think that I, I did, but I rode the ranch, trained uh, with Eddie, Wayne, Kaczynski, my dad, Mamola. I mean, all these guys were there, and that was the highlight of my year. Um, and I think the big step that I made from 98 to 99, I had rode from like November 1st until December 22nd, at least six hours a day, probably. Two bike, two tanks of Honda 100 fuel a day, whether I had people there or by myself you know there's a, there is a guy in england i just want to tell you this a guy named russell lowe who actually owns your tz250 from 1992 he had been in touch with me this past year and one of the photos in the story i wrote ha is his is your bike in front of his garage it's got sunoco stickers on it which are kind of weird because that was never the case but other than that i mean the livery and everything is exactly right and he he reaches out to me from time to time and i was like how the heck did a guy in england get your bike there and he thinks he acquired it through Spain somehow. So you must've had it over there as well, but um, it's your bike. Hmm. Yeah, I have no idea. I think somebody had sent me an email regarding that. I, the only bike that I've ever known about was the 10 bike that I, uh, somebody out of nowhere called and got a hold of me somehow and wanted the number 10 bike uh, that I had from the Malaysia bike. And I, ha I have my championship bike still. But, and that bike had sentimental value in the aspect of it was the bike that I, it was just a replica of what I won on. And he said it was his, is gonna be his prize possession in his whole museum. And I'm going, you know, you can't afford that bike. And threw out a number somewhere of $250,000 because Kevin had sold a bike somewhere le less than that. And I just threw a number out and he's like, Oh, done. And I'm like, well, that was the wrong number then should have went higher. <laughs> but uh, apparently that's the one running around in England and stuff now. So they have it at Goodwood and places like that. Wow. But you never know. And, and you know, well, what's well, that? Go ahead. No, we were wondering. Well, uh, and this, well, the story on that bike, though, I, Matt, my mechanic came and, and went through it all. And, you know, I, I have him on tape and it's the most complete bike Suzuki, that he's ever seen out of the factory, except for my world championship bike, which was exactly, it, it was encased in time. So the fuel was still in it in theory that I had, like everything, nothing was touched. It was sent to my house with the swing arm off of it. And I put the swing arm back in with a crescent wrench. It didn't tighten it all the way because I didn't have a socket big enough. So I just, you know, the old trick to where the crescent wrench goes in and turns <laughs> the indent of the nut because I couldn't get to it. And it just, that's how it sort of sits to this day. Um, <laughs> but the, the, I, when I sold the 10 bike, I had two ROMs. And I'm like, this is like 50-50. I don't know which ROM is the right one. So apparently I said, you know, I'm guessing here, but if this isn't it, I can send you the other ROM because I, we were still putting the ROMs in the championship bike. So Honda's switching switches and starting the bikes with the computers, you know, not essentially with the computers on the two stroke, but they could run everything from the computer and, you know, Taka, my engine guy is over there doing a map and then he runs the map going, yeah, okay, I think it's right. And then he puts the, takes the duct tape off, puts the ROM in 
And I'd go out and go, no, that's too much power out of third gear now. I need more power here. Okay, and they'd program and have another ROM ready to go. So, you know, we were still in ancient history on, uh, I mean, the 500 for Yamaha, it was, you know, all the torque maps and everything were controlled with a computer. So you just plug it in with Tom O'Kane and these guys and control, you know, all the stuff. So Suzuki was back in time. I mean, I remember, you know, Tackle was saying, I can bring a 180 degree crank to Phillip Island. And I'm like, God, these guys don't mess around. I mean, this is my first test. I, tried, I tested a 60 degree, at, an 80 degree, 120 degree crank at Jerez. And we settled on the 120. And he goes, I can bring a 180 to Phillip Island three weeks from now, or maybe it was two weeks. I'm like, okay, sure. And he brought it and it was in a bag of oil in a plastic bag. <laughs> I'm like, how'd you guys make it so fast? And he goes, no, no, this is Kevin. And I'm like, oh shit. So we're putting a 1993 crank. I'm like, you sure this thing's safe? Because Phillip Island's the wrong place to be high siding in turn one. And he's like, no, no, no problem. Only 112 K. I'm like, but it's from 1993. How does it even fit in these crank cases? Oh, same crank. Uh, case. Oh, Jesus. Yeah. So then you're hitting the, you know, I'm setting fast times. I remember beating McDoing's time and it was in all the papers and it, it but there was like no wind, <clears throat> nobody else is on the track. And I'm just on this 180 degree old school, no power at the bottom qualifying tires just on rail and you, no way you could race it because somebody gets <laughs> in front of you and it's bogging and, blah, and you, you know you can't get out of your own way but uh, right. yeah you anyway, guys we you got guys all kinds of sean you're not going to believe this but i actually remember kenny roberts jr as being a pretty quiet kid <laughs> 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 yeah, well, my stories go on because they, they go down different different holes. Well, yeah, but they, and they're all really good. But yeah. like somebody's going to find me soon. Like, I don't know if it'd be the FCC or somebody for doing the world's longest podcast, but there's probably a, a especially <laughs> in California, there's probably a fine that, that's going to have to be paid now because of the stories went so long. So we got to do a mini series, I think. <laughs> I agree. Well, we're, we, we, yeah, we are working on that. And one of the things that, like I was talking with Paul, we need to, we need to, I'm in the process now of getting most of my dad's stories because his are even better. And yeah, uh, you know, they're all true and they're all, you know, got great substance behind them. And, you know, Paul's dad, you know, Kel, I, I want to get him talking because, you know, all these things, are, it, you know, it's, it's the Michael Jordan stuff that people are just captivated by and, we this will just be forgotten if we don't get it out there so no you're right, right. You know, feel free to to reach out but it, this is a tip of the iceberg i mean <laughs> there there are stories that i for there there's more stuff i've forgotten than probably most modern motor gv guys would never even uh you know out of a 10 rear know about a motorcycle from the factory side of building it if you know what i'm getting at. yeah right i mean uh, well, none of the honda riders have ever even seen a gearbox so <laughs> Right. Because it's secret, you know, they don't want that Steptronic gearbox. Oh, yeah, they're just, they're just taking yeah. motors in and out, and it's not like it used to be. Yeah, but. I'm the guy taking dowel pins when they rebuilt the crank on Saturday night, and I put a dowel pin when they're all done in the middle of the pan, of the stainless pan, and they're like, dude, <laughs> did you put that there to, to the mechanic? And he's like, no, where was it at? It was in the bin. So they now they're thinking I got to split the cases again because there's a dowel pin, or I put a piston ring, just a little clip in there, and they would be questioning themselves. And this is 11 o'clock at night, so we're time. still pouring over data. <laughs> All right, well, it was always short lived. We're gonna have to do they, we're gonna have to do part two, three, four, five, and six, Kenny, because I got of course. I'm cutting both you guys off. Oh, we got more. Okay, <laughs> we'll we'll pick it up again. Well, Kenny, I really appreciate you doing this. I know it's, uh, I know it's, it, it's cool for you to talk about all this stuff, and they're really good stories. And I know our our listeners are going to get a, a they're going to learn a lot from from hearing what you had to say. So, so it'll be fun to hear what their responses are. But uh, yeah, thanks a lot sure. for for yeah. joining us. And <laughs> no worries. We'll have you back again, and I've got to get up and uh, and and pay a visit at some point. 
Yeah, absolutely. And, you know, just make it a two part and we can jump on other stuff. I mean, um, Definitely. it's all, you know, the more we get on, on record of the, the things, the, the other questions evolve from where you thought the interview was going to go to where it ends up. So <laughs> right. it's not my first, first rodeo with this. Okay, guys. Thank you, Sean. Thanks, right. Paul. Yeah, thank right, you. you guys take care.